blog, How to Run a Successful Company. Um, and these practices, these tunnels, and this accountability and everything that we talked about are processes and systems and levels of accountability, even the way that we meet, the, the amount of time that we spend in meetings, and then the information that's exchanged in meetings, um, all has a, a very definitive purpose, and it's to drive the company forward. And our vision identifies what we believe are the most impactful things that we should be working on that will translate to the overall success and health of the company. So um, everything that we talk about this stuff is just the best way possible that we've found to try and run a successful company where the people are rewarded for their, their, their achievements, um, they feel appreciated, they feel like their opinion is valued, um, and it truly is. Right? Like we take everything that we discuss when we talk about improvement, we talk about process, like everybody in here in some capacity has sat in a meeting, had the opportunity, not only the opportunity, but we, we require you to voice your opinion. And everybody here, including myself, has worked places to where, how many times have you been told, well, we just do it that way because that's the way it's always been done, right? Like I, I can personally say that I've worked places that that was the response, and I was conditioned to accept that, right? Like who was I to challenge that? Um, there are set parameters and reasons why we do things the way that we do them, but we have a regular cadence and opportunities in the level tens that you guys sit in. Right? What do we talk about? What have you heard from customers? What suggestions do you have about how to improve? What challenges are you having? What's not working? What problems are you having with people or, or technology or process? The reason all of those, those meetings start that way is because we want to flush out what you guys are hearing and seeing and doing that are creating um, either wins for you or creating challenges so that we can put some action behind it and fix it. So the whole reason why we run this company is with it, that, that way is to have an end in mind and work towards that goal, um, which without that, you, you kind of, right, we do a lot of, of, of chasing our tails, so to speak. So that's the reasoning behind why we, we, we went and, and adopted this, this business practice inside of our company. Um, and, I, and I can personally tell you over the last two and a half to three years, it's it is, it is really paid off, and it gives us a, a real process and a reasoning behind what we do. So if you ask why we do something a certain way, the answer should not be that's why we've always done it. Or it's the way that we, someone should have a legitimate answer of why we do it that way, right? And if you have uh, an opinion or suggestions about how to improve it, there's a platform from every person that sits in this room to be able to speak and have a voice about what we do and how we do it. And if you have a good idea of how to improve that, make it more efficient, more profitable, take less time. Um, this last week we ended up, um, some of you may have seen, I think some of you even attended, um, where we, we have too many properties to walk on market. Um, between myself and Dave and I, we were trying to hit eight to 10 properties a day and it just wasn't, it wasn't reasonable. And uh, just through this EOS system, we talked about how to improve that. We came up with a, the idea of having 10 to 15 people sign up, have the ability to be able to accept the more. I think our first one's gonna go out today. We had a training yesterday. Yeah, um, how about the half hour? So we'll dispatch, and how many properties are on that list? Um, I think there were six or seven on there, and they're almost all claims except for one right now. So six, when that, so 30 minutes ago, seven of them went out, six of them already claimed, and then there's deadlines for each of those, where those folks will walk through that property and send us the data that we need to be able to make an offer and negotiate that deal and then successfully win somewhere between 10 to 20% of the deals that we make offers on. So what it'll do is allow us to make more often, more, more offers more often in a shorter period of time which will translate to us buying more homes. Um, but that was the result of the way that we run our company. That just didn't happen in a vacuum. Does it make sense? Um, so to, to, to when you start this process, you have to start with right people, right seat, and a big part of that um, exercise is defining the company's core values. Like, what do you stand for? Why are you doing what you do? What, what are you non-negotiable? What, what are your, um, you know, what, what uh, I can't remember Gary's the terminology, but there's things that, um, that attract you to someone and there's people that, there's things that repel you from people, right? Like, you ever run into somebody and they go, you didn't talk to them, but something about the way they sit, the way their hair's done, the shoes that they're wearing, or how they might communicate with a waiter or waitress or um, a flight attendant. Did you ever just be around someone without ever having any conversation with them? Either like, hey, I just, there's something about that person. It's, I can't stand them. I, 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 maybe I'm the only person, but um, it happens. And then there's other people that you feel naturally, like you know, um, you gravitate towards, like just the way they carry themselves, how respectful they are to the people that they 
communicate with. Um, that all translates back to core values. And just to reiterate, when we went through this exercise, we listed at one point used to be up on the wall. Mike's been part of doing these in different companies probably a dozen times. But we put up the things that are important to us, things that we admire about people that are in our lives, and then we go through this process of narrowing 40 values down to, to what the four real core values are. These four core values are non-negotiable. Um, they started with myself, then translated to the leadership team, and everybody that sits in this room um, is either respectful of these core values or shares these same four. They might not be your core values, but they're somewhere in your value system, or we, we wouldn't have hired you, and you wouldn't feel comfortable working here. Um, one of these four things, or any of these four things, just didn't resonate with you. So they are uh, perspectives and beliefs. The easiest way for me to describe is just your attitude. Um, are you a positive person, or are you always seeking and, and optimistic about um, the likelihood of finding a solution, or are you always putting holes in stuff, and, and are, are you uh, relatively negative, or are you constantly reminding people why things won't work out, or are you one of the people that will um, encourage people to, to keep going because you believe that it is possible with the right amount of time and attention? Um, that's really, really important to me. Negative people I just cannot be around. I, mean, I, I can't be around them. Um, as salespeople, and, and myself being a salesperson, um, it's the most important, valuable asset we have is our attitude. If your attitude is off, um, you, will, you will just not be successful. So for me, I protect my perspective and my attitude as if it's the most important thing to me because it is. Um, it changes the way I communicate with people, how I interact with my family, how I interact with you all. Um, so I'm very protective of, of my attitude. I try and control as much of it as I can myself. Um, and I surround myself with people that are encouraging and, and, and positive and are always seeking solutions, not pointing out problems. Does that make sense? So everybody here, um, at least we believe so, <laughs> has a good perspective on things and, and the belief um, that anything can be done with the right amount of time and attention. And number two is integrity and consistency. Uh, we just believe that you, if you say you're going to do something, you need to be counted on and be able to do it. Um, you know, particularly in real estate, um, those of you that are part of real estate transactions that you from the beginning to the end, there's nothing more frustrating um, or discouraging to a client when things don't go the way they're supposed to. Um, a lot of that is beyond our control, um, but a lot of it is also within our control. Um, if you tell somebody you're gonna do something, we need to be able to count on you to do it. Um, that's how we're able to avoid plagues like micromanaging, right? Like we wanna be able to give everybody that works here a tremendous amount of freedom to make decisions, do what they think is best, network with, with clients, um, make decisions on the fly. And it requires two things. One, training. Like you need to understand what our practices are, what our policies are. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as a real estate agent, you need to understand what the, the law says. Um, so we have to be able to train you. Um, but then there also needs to be a high level of integrity. Um, like I know without a shadow of a doubt, like if you know, using Liz as an example, we've done 1,500 real estate transactions. I have no doubt in my mind that she's constantly making the right decision based on what is morally correct and then what's in the best interest of not only the client but us. And it's a constant balance of those things. Um, so having integrity is super important. Does it make sense? Does everybody understand that, like, what, what integrity really means? It's, doing, it's basically doing what you said you were going to do. A lot of people confuse honesty and integrity. And I'll give you just a real quick example because Anthony's only given me 10 minutes. But honesty means, if I ask Jason, I go, hey, Jason, did you follow up that customer? He goes, nope. He's being honest, right? But if he told me he was going to call the customer, and he told the customer he would call, and he didn't, he lacks integrity. Does that make sense? That's the difference. I don't mean to pick on Jason. I think he's both honest and has a high level of integrity. But does that, do you see the difference between honesty and integrity? You can be an honest person and still lack integrity. Integrity is doing what you said you were going to do. Um, and again, what that creates here as a culture is it allows us to give you the freedom without micromanaging. Um, and uh, it just it, it contributes to a better culture. It contributes to better results. You spend less time answering questions about what you're doing. You spend more time doing and producing. So that, that's why integrity is important to us. Um, excellence, you just always want to be the best. Like we never measure ourselves um, necessarily on how we compare to other teams. Like, if, if, honestly, if we did that, um, it would probably stun our growth because if you look at consistently um, what we produce inside of Keller Williams, like it's, it's literally a laughable difference between 
our volume and, 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 and our units versus the other teams, if, if we allowed that to dictate how high and how far we wanted to go, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do the job that we do. We're always comparing ourselves to what's possible and being the best. And the best isn't necessarily just being the best in our market or the best in our office. It's being the best at everything that we do. So we constantly push to get better. Um, and that just comes from a core value of just wanting to be excellent, just being the best that we can possibly be. Um, and then respect. Um, I think it you know, almost goes without saying, but um, a core value for me and a core value of our company is just treating people that you work with with a, um, a very high level of respect, um, you know, from the way that you communicate with them, being respectful of people's time, um, respecting the urgency that sometimes comes along with you know, our transactions sometimes. As a real estate agent, um, you know, your clients call you and it's a, it's a, it's a stressful, major, um, you know, milestone for them in their life. So it's important that you understand the urgency and the importance of those transactions when you work with people, uh, whether it's as a buyer's agent, a list agent, um, you know, an acquisitions agent, project manager, whatever it may be, um, you know, that all of that just kind of circles back to respect and understanding the amount of time and energy and effort that goes into what we do. Um, and being respectful of the people that we work with and the people that we work for. Um, it's just non-negotiable for us, right? Like if anybody would walk around here and be disrespectful to people, I don't, I don't think anybody would want to work with them. Um, I can't, I don't. Um, so we're very protective about that when we bring people on board. Um, we just need to be super respectful. Um, you know, there's a, an old saying that says, you know, should we talk to treat the, the janitor the same way we treat the CEO of the company? And that's, that's how we operate. Um, regardless of what your position or pay or tender is at this company, you deserve a high level of respect. And uh, everybody here should, should treat you with that respect because you, you've earned it. Um, you deserve it as a, as a member of this team. Um, so it's just really important to us. Um, it's also for people that we work with, people that don't work here. Um, we've had occasions where, you know, whether it be a, a vendor or a client that was disrespectful to someone here, we've severed relationships because of it. Um, we've had, um, I don't remember the, the exact instance, but um, it may have been a contractor that uh, okay. you know, uh, <laughs> was working with us and the project manager was holding them accountable to do their job and they mf Chad or one of the project managers. You gotta go. Can't, we, we, we had a guy that used to do our carpet installation for, I mean, he's actually Mike, yeah, 10 years. And um, we went through a sort of a, an audit process and found out he wasn't doing anything wrong, but we found that we could get flooring installed for a third of the price. And all we did was give him the opportunity to match it. And he just, you know, he called Mike and somebody else, not even myself, every name in the book, and said, you know what, man, let's just, we're not. Regardless of price, we're, just, we're not going to work with you. Just, you can't treat people like that. Uh, three days later, he called back and apologized and wanted to do our flooring. It's, I mean, at that point, the, the bridge had been burnt. Um, so anyway, respect is obviously a, a really important thing. Um, and uh, you know, it's one of our core values. And it's, it's the, the other part about these four core values is they also provide guiding principles for you to make decisions where otherwise, sometimes it may be difficult. Um, we constantly refer back to our core values if we're in a gray area, if we're stuck and having a tough time making a difficult decision. We'll revert back to what our core values will dictate, right? Like, how, what's the most respectful way to handle this situation? Are we operating with a high level of integrity? Should we have a more positive perspective and belief as we approach this challenge? Um, so it's also a guiding set of principles um, that you know, helps us um, make decisions about you know, big decisions, whether it be personnel related, marketing related, transactional, um, things of that sort. So that's the reasoning behind the core values. Um, our core focus then is, right, once we understand like who we are, uh, what is our focus, and they break it up into purpose, cause, and passion. And uh, for us, that's described as a commitment to create new opportunities and improve the lives of our people, everybody in here, in our community. Our community stretches from um, the people that, you know, live and go to the same schools that we do and, you know, um, our children, as well as our investors and people that live outside of this area, your community stretches beyond the you know the five block radius that we live and work in, and a dedication to continuous improvement. Our niche is single family residential real estate. So now when you've narrowed it down, it keeps a focus, right? So they're not getting distracted and constantly getting into new businesses or um, 
you know, getting off track, that core focus helps us stay focused on the things that contribute to our mission. Um, and then our five-year target is we want to improve the lives of 5,000 people. So how did we arrive at 5,000 people? Um, we basically took the amount of transactions, homes that we buy and sell, and then for every home that you buy and sell, there's anywhere from five to 10 people that it impacts. So if today Doug and his team buy a home from, we're buying one in Camp Hill, and there's a, an executor, and then there's four family members involved in the decision that are all in some capacity getting money or proceeds from the sale. Um, if the person bought the house is being compensated, they're earning commission, right? And we're gonna either wholesale it to another investor that's gonna employ six contractors and renovate it. So in any given real estate transaction, it, it extends to three to, to 10 people um, that it has an impact on. Um, so we had set out this five-year target. We envisioned 30 employees. We've surpassed that number. 600 wholesale deals in five years, 200 retail sales, total generating $9 million in revenue. Um, and as a company, we always get back 10% of our net revenue. That would allow us to give away nearly a million dollars in the conclusion of that five years. Um, so, so that's our core values. Um, that's our core focus, and that's our five-year target. We just want you to understand that why we do what we do and what the big picture looks like, because we all get so focused on what we do on a daily basis, whether it's accounting or project management or representing buyers and sellers or working in lead management, wholesaling properties. It's important to us that you understand how, how the piece of, of, of what you do each day contributes to a much bigger picture. Everybody in this room is playing a part in us giving away a million dollars. Right? So I don't know, I couldn't do it without you, and I don't know how many people in this room could do it without the rest of us, right? So it's important that you all understand how your, your job and your role plays a part in us being able to give away a million dollars. Um, it's not a lottery, we give it away, for those of you that didn't see it, we give it away to those that are less fortunate than we are. Um, there's different children groups, um, there's different uh, churches that we've helped, um, help people through tough times and Thanksgiving and Christmas and stuff like that. So the bigger job we do, the bigger impact we can have. Um, that's really what it's all about for me, um, is having a bigger impact on everybody's lives. Um, everybody in this room, your families, your kids, the, just everything. It's the, for me, that's why I get up every day. That's why I do what I do. Um, the houses and stuff is cool. I got like picking out kitchens. We just got pictures of the 23 John Randolph. It's one of the, the nicer renovations we've ever done. Um, but to me, it's, it's bigger than just those homes and those kitchens and those baths. It's the opportunities that that creates. Uh, someone's going to sell that house and generate a commission. There's contractors that worked in there for six weeks. Ferg bought the house. Doug supported him. Like there's just there's 10 or 12 people that when I look at that house, that picture, that are going to be positively impacted because of that transaction. And, and for me, that's what it's all about. Um, and I hope that you guys share those, those same feelings and motivations and, and you know, can get behind stuff like that. Um, that's it. Make sense? I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. You guys give Eric a round of applause. <laughs> the, the applause isn't for the, the, the vision speech. It's really because you know, none of this would be possible without Eric and Eric's vision. Um, I'd al also like just to add to that, like this wouldn't be possible without his support. So. He supports you guys, honestly, on a daily basis in everything that you do. You don't get to see it. You don't get to hear it. Maybe you do. Maybe he, you know, connects with you. But I, I want you guys to know, like, he's, he's there supporting you guys every single day. Um, so I want to just cover real quick, what is it that, what's the nuts and bolts of this whole entire thing? Um, we meet every year, um, and we define what our one-year plan is. And this is the second year we've been able to do this. Um, so we met in January, we went through a one-year plan. The plan allows us to identify what we need to do in order to hit our targets. So if you look at the top left-hand corner, uh, future date of 1 -1 2021, we will have accomplished these things over the next year. Gross profit of 4.8 million, that's 420,000 per month in gross profit, uh, with a target net profit of 1.8. Uh, measurables per month, and I apologize, the, when I change these, change these two per month, the novations and retail are left in there, that's per year. So the 24 novations, 24 retail should be two per month. 
for each one of those. And then our measurable for turnkey is to sell 10 turnkeys per month. Measurable for wholesale is eight. So let me pause there real quick. Everything that we do beyond that, so our one year plan, our strategic plan is then to hit those targets. Okay, so these are targets that we're hitting monthly so that we hit our yearly goals. The goal for um, all market acquisitions was to buy six turnkeys and two retails per month. Where's Dave? Is Dave here, right? Dave. Dave and Eric bought seven last week. It's pretty impressive. So what I want to share with you guys is there's often times where we're exceeding these targets as well. Um, it's amazing that we're able to do that. Um, what I'll share with you is that impacts the rest of the EOS model too. It impacts your process. It impacts the people when we go above targets. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but just know that when we exceed goals, some things are gonna shift and some things may break. And those are the times when we want you to raise your hand and say, of course, any other time as well, and say, hey, I think we're having an issue here. We may need to improve this. Uh, so moving down the line, complete 75% of projects on time and on budget. Right now, at this point in the year, we're tracking at 41% of that 75%. So we have a long way to go. We have a lot of things to do and improve. The great news is Mike has helped us redefine that process, put Chad in a position to be the, the estimator to get the project manager's focus. So again, I want to show you guys, I want to tell you some real world experiences that we're having that back up uh, some of these rocks and goals. So buy 60 homes off market, Doug's right on target for that. Increase, uh, that 60 homes is for a quarter. Increase profit per deal by selling 20% of turnkey in-house and 80% of wholesale in-house. So some of you were involved in the, the recent process change that we did um, with wholesale and, and doing a 72 hour time period where Justin can uh, increase the urgency of the wholesale buyers um, by having having the wholesales exclusively released to those wholesale buyers and not onto the MLS. So that was as a result of this goal. Develop process and accountability to result in four listings per week. Start 32 short sales on and off market. Um, and if you haven't met or talked to Jason yet, he's doing a phenomenal job. Plug him right in. Got how many listings in your first week? Four and sold one of them immediately, right? Right. And how many appointments did you take total? Five? More than that, uh, six. Six, so four out of six of the appointments that he took, he was able to list. And where did the lead come from that sold with multiple offers? Isaiah. From what, the text? Oh, man. Yes. Had to be. Yes, it was, yes, thanks. So, just think about that for a second. How much, what was the listing, 159,000? 149. So $150,000 listing that resulted in how many offers? Three. And how long was it listed? I didn't get paid. From a flipping text message. Right? <laughs> like, but the idea is that we didn't just like stumble upon this idea. If we were constantly searching for new ways to, to generate motivated seller leads because whether you're in, in retail as a licensed agent, whether you're in acquisitions or you're wholesale or short sales, like the, the, the crown jewel is a motivated seller, right? Because once you get a motivated seller, like what do buyers call about? Do they call about the theory of buying a home? No, they call about a house. That's what, that's what generates or typically starts a buyer's interest, right? So when you have the listing, you control the buyers. And for us, we were searching for new ways that were cost effective to basically leverage data we already know. So the person he's texting, we've already called, we've digitally tried to, to, to put our message in front of them, whether it's through Facebook or Google, um, but just through um, our, our mastermind group that we leave for them, it's, it's, that everybody takes a vacation and, and swimming in San Diego and enjoying the beaches, everybody uh, says, how was your vacation when you get back? But it is nice to be in San Diego. Um, what we do work, believe it or not. Uh, Mike's been there, he can vouch for it. I work more than Mike. Anyway, it's, it's, when we came there, we found that there were people that were getting results from, from texting, from information that they had already deployed. And the biggest difference is, is that that person may have got five postcards from five different companies, but they got one text message. 
And if you think about it, like what's the most personable form of communication these days? It's text, right? I actually get like, annoyed when people call me. Like, why would you call me? <laughs> why wouldn't you just text me? Like, that's how rude. Um, but, you know, so now we, we've really seen results with texting and it took Alicia and Sarah and Isaiah and the rest of the, the lead management team to put all of that together so he's not just randomly texting people, like there's a whole process behind that. Um, and it took us probably well over, you know, a month, a month and a half of research and development and implementation to make that happen. And it's awesome when we start to see results like that. From it. So I just wanted to give you a little background about how that lead came about, the time and energy that goes into it. So it's cool. Um, moving along, generate 325 motivated seller leads using a $40,000 monthly budget. So let, let me just pause for a second and share with you guys. These are goals for a year. Your leadership team is so oftentimes um, hitting these yearly goals in a quarter. You see that play out often um, in what we do. So we'll do uh, a better job of communicating these quarterly goals, company quarterly goals to you guys on a regular basis as well. The last one being for us, we're at run property management using EOS at 90% or better. And then moving along to the rocks that we've established for the first quarter of this year, we have a month left. Um, increased profit per deal again by selling 20% of turnkey in house and 80% of wholesale in house became a quarterly rock. Hire and train uh, an onboard project manager, quarterly rock. Uh, and then what does that do? So if we bring Bill in, that rock then is we get another project manager, and that allows us to move closer to the goal of completing 75% of our projects on time. Getting 20 deals from follow-up using Salesforce, call qualifying and agent dashboards with Alicia. Scoreboards, um, actually that is, is my rock, not Doug's. Create systems and processes that operate property management in 150 doors with Russ. How many doors do we have now, Russ? Uh, 132. So we're getting, since 132 doors that we're managing, we opened when? <laughs> January 1. Wow, a little bit before. But... Pretty crazy. Um, again, quarterly rock generate 325 motivated seller leads with Sarah, complete 15 cash out refinances with Cheryl, Anthony to do two trainings per week focused on leadership, Alicia utilizing Salesforce dashboards to achieve first response within six minutes, um, doing a great job there as well, train and delegate, Hillside, East Cam, and payroll responsibilities to Leslie is one of Cheryl's props. So again, hopefully you guys can see and then the, how these feed into the one-year plan, but then obviously you're all familiar with the issues list, and I wanted you to see real quickly just how this feeds into the rocks as well. So does anybody have any questions before I let your grumbling stomachs make sense? Good deal. Go ahead, grab something to eat. When you guys get settled in, we'll go ahead and start the peer awards. Thank you guys. No, I no, I knew you wouldn't want it. So I have it angled perfectly that it was just on Anthony and Eric. No, it's on the desk. Ferdy, you're missing Chick fil A. You want me to turn it off? And I'll go live again when we do the. You're not. <laughs>